Okay, everybody. So thanks very much for coming along to a little bit of lunch and to a lot of conversation. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, the two facilitators for this. Um, and I had asked you to come with a question and also maybe an issue regarding people, animals, or environment. So hopefully you've got some of those things kicking around. This is going to be informal. Um, it's going to be driven by your conversation with Jane. And to facilitate that, I've got Rosetta and Meta, and I'm going to turn it over to them. Okay, so does anyone have a question they'd like to start off with? Okay, maybe a bit of an intense question uh, to start off with, but um, I guess when we talk about youth kind of climate action um, and combined with, I guess, the effects of social media and being immediately exposed to a whole world of environmental issues and all of the statistics and the reports that come out and stuff like that, um, you know, I, I guess I'd really view from that to uh, for climate change really to almost be a significant or to be a significant mental health issue for a lot of youth that are actually passionate about that these days. So um, there's a lot of different conversations and philosophies around um, what are some good kind of um, thoughts to go by when you're kind of still working on climate action. And I wondered, um, I guess, what your personal philosophy is in, in kind of the drive to continue the passion that... Um, I guess oneself has and to, to keep kind of making a difference um, despite having that view and that access to all the information of these really huge global forces and stuff like that. Slightly unclear as to exactly what you want me to answer, yeah, but sure. um, I'll do it's all right. So, um, okay, I think, you know, the climate marches uh, are really wonderful at bringing attention to this issue and helping people to realize we're actually in crisis that climate change is, is real. Um, what I wonder about is how many of the young people on these marches are actually there because they're passionate or because they want to take a day off school. I know for a fact that some are there because they want to take a day off school and they want to have fun because they've told me. And um, one parent said to me, well, I, my daughter wanted to join a march. This was in Australia. And I asked her, okay, you're going to march and you want the government to, to make laws. What do you want the government to do? And the child said, I don't know. So her mother said, right, you can't go on the march then. So the, the main thing is to march and protest is great, but you can't point your finger at somebody and say, you've got to do more unless you also are doing your bit. So it's like tying up with you know, the kind of activities going on at this school and tying it up with roots and shoots so that you, you march, but you have a, a reason because you are doing your bit too. And that's the only way that you can, you know, ethically approach the government like that or business. Thank you. Does that answer your question or not? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't understand the question, so I have no idea if Sorry I answered that. it. Hi. Um, hi. <laughs> um, I was wondering, since I think an issue all of us passionate people have faced when wanting to combat an issue is um, coming up against people who like firmly believe Jackson. Sorry, Rosie sorry, talk a bit louder, slower. Sorry. Your accent in New Zealand is <laughs> <laughs> so quickly. Yeah, An 85 we... year old ears are not as good as yours. <laughs> um, we face the issue of coming up against people who believe strongly, like very different to us. That doesn't English properly. That um, what's different? Um, they have juxtaposing beliefs. So what would you suggest doing when you come up against someone who firmly believes something opposite to what you're trying oh, to okay. come up against? <clears throat> yeah, well, I was, I was given the first lesson by my mother, my same amazing mother. And she said, Jane, if you find somebody who doesn't think the same way as you do, number one, listen to them, see where they're coming from, see why they think the way they think. Maybe they've got a point you never thought about. 
um, if you still, after having a conversation, uh, feel that you're more right than they are, then you've got to have the courage of your conviction. So how do you get through to them? It's no good arguing. You watch two people arguing, and they get more and more uh, into, they're not, they stop listening because they're always trying to think of how they're going to defend their position. So you've got to get into the heart. And the only way I know how to do that is through stories through stories. Right. When I first had to confront the scientists who were keeping chimps in five foot by five foot cages to do medical research, and so <clears throat> I somehow got invited to one of their gatherings, and they were all out for my blood, all of them. And I think they expected, you know, I'd be like one of these very strident animal rights groups. And instead of confronting them with the, what I thought were the terrible things they were doing to the chimps, I simply showed slides and talked about the chimps of Gombe and the kind of social life they had and the fun the young ones had playing and how the adults would sit around grooming and then laze about in the sun and make comfortable beds at night. And in their minds, they had to compare it with a five-foot-by-five-foot cage with steel bars all around, steel bars on the floor. And gradually, that has led to change. All the, all the National Institutes of Health chimps, 400 of them, are all out in sanctuaries now. Hey, that was really helpful. Hi, I am really excited to meet you here and because if someone had told me five years ago that I'm going to meet you I would have thought it's going to be in Africa <laughs> but here at the other side of the world I think it's amazing uh, well I've seen uh, you've done quite a lot of work in many parts of Africa and uh, recently in Senegal mm -hmm. yeah we've established like a sanctuary I was just wondering, in Nigeria we have this Nigeria Cameroon chimpanzees. They are also endangered. And right now... Are you talking about the chimps that were in the New York Blood Center that are being looked after? Or are you talking about wild chimps? Wild ones. Wild ones. Wild ones. And so I'm just wondering, right now, um, the situation I must confess the situation is not as good as it used to be. There's um, a lot of poachers, violent herdsmen, kidnappers. So it's becoming dangerous for ecologists to work in the wild, for conservation biologists. Yeah. So I'm just thinking. Uh, and so it's also very dangerous for them too because like, mm. they are not safe. Considering their large home ranges, you know, it's going to be a bit difficult to establish a sanctuary again, apart from the other reserves that are there for them. So now I'm seeing that they're in the reserve too. They are, they are not as safe as they used to be. Would you uh, advocate for something like a mini zoo for them to be kept in? or? Do you think, is there a way that you think we can sustain uh, their genetics? Or what do you well, think can we, be done about this kind of issues to go around this kind of We issues? had quite a big effort to get the chimps out of the zoo they had there because it was so bad. Um, <clears throat> the, these, these chimpanzees that were caught and used by the New York Blood Center, yeah. the, they did their work in, um, in situ in the country. And then, after a certain time, uh, because of the violence, they left. But they left the chimps, and they said, OK, we'll continue to provide money to feed them. And some very brave staff stayed on during the height of the war. Some of them got killed. Some of the chimps got killed. Um, they're now, then they were put back on the island, but they were basically starving. Nobody was feeding them except these few keepers who was getting the food that they could. But now this couple, Jenny and I can't remember their names, but they're there and they are taking in all sorts of orphan chimps 
and everybody's working hard to get the money to maintain this sanctuary that they've started, and they're not going to give up. So I think, you know, there is a sanctuary. It just needs support. It is hard. A lot of these African countries, yeah. you know, the, the chimps are being protected even when bullets are being fired. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. It's an honour to meet you. Um, sort of following on a little bit from the last question, um, what are your opinions on zoos generally? Because some conservation experts don't like them, they prefer for animals to be in the wild. But then... <laughs> um, but then at the same time when there's poachers, it may be safe for, the, for them to be kept in a can. Okay, well, I'm often, often, often asked about zoos. Number one, the quality of the zoos, the good zoos, has just, I mean, it's so different to when I was young. And, you know, many of the zoos have really big enclosures. They understand the needs of the animals. We've pushed, and I'm very proud of this because I started it, enriching the environment, giving them something to do. Because chimp animals like chimpanzees, gorillas, elephants, the intelligent ones, but even, you know, octopus, they get bored. And you imagine being trapped in a, in a place, even if it's quite big, with nothing to do. It's terrible. So the good zoos are, A, providing a good environment, caring people, good veterinary care, um, and they're also raising money for conservation in, in the place where the animals come from. But I think the thing that we have to realize is there's this, this perception that to be in the wild is the best possible place for an animal to be. But if you spend as long as I have, out in forests where you can hear the chainsaws approaching, where you know that the area is planned for oil and gas ex exploration, um, when you know about the poachers and the bushmeat trade and chimpanzees fleeing a certain area because of, the, because of the approaching danger, but then they go into another area and chimps are very territorial, so they'll probably get killed. And so I was, the other day I was in one of the big, better zoos in the U.S. And it was a really nice big enclosure. And there were four males just hanging out. It was getting towards evening. It was nice and cool. They were grooming each other. And there were three infants and a juvenile playing. And the mother's just kind of sitting like mothers do. And so I thought to myself, now put myself in a chimp's mind. Not this political discussion, but I'm going to be a chimp, and I know enough about chimps to think I know. I'd rather be with that group in that zoo than out in a part of the forest living in danger every single day. Dave, which, what zoo was that? It was, uh, was either, I think it was Fort Worth. Fort Worth? Okay. But I mean, there's, there's an amazing group of chimps in Wellington, and in Australia there's at least five zoos that I know of that have amazing chimps. I think the one in Sydney, they've got something like 30 chimps and there's, they put themselves in two groups with a, there's a little moat with a river over it. And they, I mean, it's so wild-like, you know. Huh. They occasionally fight, but that's normal. Yeah. People do too. Yeah. <laughs> My generation is very engaged in issues of our time, but is there anything you worry we may leave behind or forget about? Anything what? Any issues you worry may, we may forget about? If we're so focused on something like climate action, is there anything you worry we may, we may leave behind? Well, I think the point, that the, the most important thing to remember is all of these problems are interrelated. So, you know, work out what has led to climate change. and. According to me, there's three major problems, well, actually four, that we have to solve. Um, one is extreme poverty, because if you're really poor, you're going to destroy the environment because you have to to survive. If you're in an urban area, you're going to buy the cheapest food. You can't afford to ask how it got there. 
because you have to live and feed your family. And second big problem is unsustainable lifestyles of so many people. My lifestyle is unsustainable. I'm, I'm flying all the time, but I do every single thing I can, um, you know, to, to mitigate that. And fortunately, Roots and Shoots around the world has planted millions of trees, millions. So my, I know my carbon footprint is, is absorbed. And when people say, Jane, you should have a private plane. <laughs> oh, no, I will never do that. Um, and, you know, thinking about when you go out shopping, do you actually need that thing? Trouble is, nothing's black and white. You do, you do what you think is right. You stop <laughs> buying. You, you make do with what you have. Um, Gandhi said the world can provide, in, the planet can provide enough for human need, but not human greed. And then you do that, and then all the businesses get angry and say, well, all our workers are going to go starving because now you're not buying their products. So you, this is, you have to realize nothing's black and white. And you have to be prepared to think of the consequences of those choices you make. The next big problem, which people don't want to talk about, is overpopulation, our ever-growing human populations. And to my absolute horror, China and Tanzania have just told women to have more children. Tanzania is the fastest growing um, African country, I think. And, um, and then finally, there's corruption and all those things. And so if you, if you get a group together, which is part of what Roots and Shoots does, and think, you know, what is contributing to climate change? Just work out all the different things. And then nobody can do everything. So once you've worked out all the different things leading to climate change, say, that's the issue I'm going to work on. And hopefully this, as you know, the good side of overpopulation is enough people to work on all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you talked before about how talking to people who have different opinions to you, you tell them stories, but often when you talk to people who may not be super invested or know that much about the climate or different environmental issues, you're met with sort of hostility because you're challenging their comfort and they feel sort of attacked by what you're telling them. So. How have you found, what have you found to be the most effective way to communicate issues with people that solve, not solve the issue, but sort of get the point across mm -hmm. and make them act? Well, what you just said is exactly what I said don't do. Don't challenge them. Just don't challenge them. Don't be, I'm holier than thou. You know, so um, I'll give you a great example. I was, I had to go from London to Heathrow to go for three weeks to America. And it was five in the morning, and I was going to snooze in my cab. But the driver recognized me, and he started off uh, literally attacking me, saying, you're one of those people. You're just like my sister. There's all these starving people. And my sister goes and gives up her time and money to, to work in a shelter for animals. I can't stand all you people who think animals are that much more important. So I let him rant for a bit. And then instead of having my snooze, I went onto that jump seat that you get in a London taxi cab. And so I, I talked to him about the chimps at Gombe, but I also talked, and I said, you know, you're absolutely right. And that's why we have this program to improve the lives of people in Gombe. And I said, we're getting scholarships to keep girls in school. And um, we've got our groups working on food banks and saving food. and raising up money to help immigrants and that sort of thing. I told him all these things didn't make any difference. So when we got to Heathrow, um, he didn't have any change. And it wasn't the days when you could pay with a little piece of cardboard. It was the days when you had to have money, actual money. And so he owed me 10 pounds. And I said, well, give it as a donation to your sister, thinking, well, he's going to go and have extra drinks in the pub. When I got back, I had a letter from his sister. And she said, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your donation. Secondly, what did you do to my brother? <laughs> she said, he's been twice to the shelter with me. He's asked me questions. And um, I've had this again and again. I met some farmers in Nebraska where I go to watch the sandhill cranes migrate. 
and the farmers are, you know, trying to use up more and more land and using too many pesticides and it gets washed down, it's polluting the river, all that sort of thing. And so I met with some of them and they were kind of like this. So I started off with a pant hoot and then I told them a bit about the chimps and our program to help the people. And I said, well, you know, there's lots of things we could do to help you farmers and the cranes, such a spectacle, this migration. You know, I could help to bring in more tourists and maybe you could meet some, make some money by putting a little tourist lodge on your land. Oh, well, I, I, I don't want to deal with people. I said, no, you wouldn't have to deal with people. We'll do that for you. And that there was one farmer who was older and obviously the others respected him. And after a bit, he uncrossed his arms. And he looked at me, he said, I didn't think you'd be like this. <laughs> and so we ended up having a really productive conversation, which has led to the development of tourism. So don't be confrontational. Don't make them feel you're attacking them and criticizing them. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, thanks for coming. So you've been doing this for quite a while, probably a lot longer than most other people here. And longer was... than before your mothers were born. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like I've kind of just gotten more involved recently, but I'm finding it, and I'm sure many others are too, it's quite overwhelming all of the information that we receive on like how bad the state of the earth is and all of the problems that we're facing. So I was wondering how you've stayed so positive and so impassioned over all of your years working on this. Okay, well, first of all, you know the expression, think globally, act locally. Well, don't do that because just what you've said, if you think globally, you're utterly depressed because you think of all the problems and people are much more aware now about what's going on, but they don't know what to do about it. So they sink into apathy and do nothing. However, that's what our Roots and Shoots program and other such organizations are all about. You cannot do everything. What are you passionate about? Some people are passionate about planting more trees, some want to clean streams, some want to go on beach cleanups, um, some want to write lobbying letters, some want to raise money for um, refugees somewhere or earthquake victims, some want to go and volunteer in an animal shelter. And so you choose something that you feel passionate about and then you set to work with your friends to, to actually do whatever it is. And then you see, gosh, we, we've really made a difference here. Um, there's lots of examples of young people actually making a difference. Then, you know, others around the world are passionate like me and you can find that out through social media. And so the way I've been talking about it is imagine the globe is a huge jigsaw puzzle and the pieces where we've harmed the planet, they're black. But if you take your little black piece of jigsaw puzzle and you work on it and you improve it, then it gradually becomes green. So as we have more and more people around the world working on their little problems, the jigsaw is going to go from black to greener to greener. and We eventually hope it'll be green. But what do you do when you're up against a dictator like president? You can't tackle them. Not really. And uh, so you just have to make sure that you work with young people so that they're ready to take over when the time comes. Maintain the values. Don't give up. That's what people did in the war, the resistance movement. It seemed impossible to defeat the might of Germany, but they never gave up. They died in, the, in their effort, but they never gave up. And guess who won the war? <laughs> Hi, Jane. Um, is there any one person that you feel significantly influenced the path that your life has taken and, and how? Well, the, the, 
my mother enabled me to take the path, the influences, I mean, they really were Dr. Doolittle and Tarzan. <laughs> because that's, I, you know, there wasn't, you know, there was no television, no media. We couldn't afford films, there was a war, so it was books. And then, of course, the person who, in, who, who really enabled me to do it was Dr. Leakey. And then there were two other beings who were really important in my life. One was my dog, Rusty, and the other was David Greybeard, and I guess Flo. Are there, are there any other women who were particularly influential for you? Well, I think my entire family, my, my, it was just my mother and her sister and my grandmother. Um, they were all way ahead of their time, way ahead of their time. I, my grandmother was one of the very first people to actually get a job. She had to, the family didn't have any money, and so... Hi. Um, as a woman who began her career in a um, very male-dominated field, what would your advice be to be to somebody in a similar position? Well, you see, I wasn't impacted at all by the fact. I mean, going out into the wild and studying animals wasn't dominated by males at all. There was nobody doing it, really. So it was, it was wide open. And then when I got to Cambridge, yes, there was a lot of pushback. And the, you know, the science of animal behavior was beginning. And it was mostly men back then. All the early um, ethologists were male. And when they were saying, you know, when the first um, stories of tool using came in, there were lots of men who said, well, why should we listen to her? She hasn't even been to college and she's just a woman. And fortunately, Lewis Leakey, of course, did believe me. And I didn't actually care because I had no goal of being a scientist. I just wanted to be a naturalist. And now I'm on the path of finding out about the chimps. We're still finding out about the chimps 60 years later. And so it was very good that Leakey sent me to Cambridge. I did need that PhD, and I loved learning how to think like a scientist, to be logical and to examine everything I put and make sure that it was as right as it could be. I, I enjoyed that a lot. And uh, so we did change the way science thought about animals. And I think most of the people today who don't want to believe that animals have personalities, minds, and emotions are the people doing nasty things to animals, like those working in intensive farms in the puppy mills and, uh, you know, anything where there's a lot of cruelty to animals. It's much more convenient to think that they don't have personality. But science has now proved that that's wrong. You can study animal mind, you can study animal personality, as well as intelligence, of course. So I just guess I was lucky. Leakey wanted a woman because he felt that uh, women were more patient and might make better observers. And when I started in Tanzania, it had just become independent. And there was a lot of resentment against white males because of the colonial regime. And, but, but these same people who were resentful of the, of the white males I was a little innocent, defenseless female. They wanted to help me, <laughs> and they did. So, you know, for me, it was lucky. But all I can say is that women have moved into fields that were only fields for men. You think of the astronauts, you think of sport, you can think of almost everything, and there are women shining in those fields. And what I love is a tribe in Latin America, and I've forgotten which country, but they say, our tribe is like an eagle. One wing is male, the other wing is female. And only when those wings are equal will our tribe fly true. So I love that. Thank you. So basically, I just say, you know, don't give up. <laughs> if you want to do something in science, do it. Um, thanks for that. 
You've mentioned for a bit about like a lot of that ignorance comes from people. I can't who... hear you. Okay. <laughs> um, you've talked quite a bit about people being ignorant when they work in industries which rely on exploitation of animals, people, the environment. Do you think it is the responsibility to fix that falls more on the people who work in those industries or the consumers of that industry? Do I think it's a responsibility? Of the consumer or the people who work in the The consumer, the, well, okay. We very much like to blame the government and very often we should blame the government. Take Trump, I blame him totally for what he's doing. <laughs> you know? he's, he's rolling back legislation, some of it put in place by Roosevelt to protect the environment and opening up coal mines and stuff. So, you know, in some cases we should blame the government. And only in a truly democratic country can, can we really say, yes, but it's up to us to elect the right people. And in a way it is, but in many countries you can protest and protest and protest, like with the Iraq war. There were people in UK, in France, in Germany, many countries, and the USA, I think, where there were hundreds of thousands of people protesting, but the government took no notice. So in that case, we point all our fingers at the government and say, you're bad. But when it comes to the corporations, uh, we, the consumers, have a huge role to play. And in fact, some of the big companies that have changed the way they produce food or they manufacture or their supply chain, they've changed because of consumer demand. Thanks. And a lovely story of my dear mother. She went in, she was quite elderly by this time, and she went into one of the big supermarkets and she asked the shop girl, she said, I don't see any free range eggs. And the girl said, what's a free range egg? And you imagine her thinking of an egg roll. I don't know what she thought, but anyway. <laughs> um, so mom started explaining about the battery farms and cutting the beaks and the tiny cages. Soon a little crowd gathered around and the manager was called to take this irritating old lady, he took her into his office. And two weeks later, free range eggs were on the shelves. So, you know, one person can make a difference. I love that story about mum. Thank you very much. Um, so, earlier you were talking about how when you were younger, a lot of people were saying that because you were a girl and you didn't have much money, you couldn't do what you wanted to do in life. Were there any times where you almost felt like giving up or just, um, doing something different because everything seemed against you? Well, one, I'm an obstinate sort of person. and um, But I knew I couldn't straight away do what I wanted. How could I? So uh, <clears throat> I took mum's advice to work hard, got this job, had to get some money. And then, you know, the stars came into it and I got invited to, to Kenya by my school friend. And from then on, it seemed, you know, everything was meant to be. And people say, well, didn't you get, feel like giving up when after four months the chimps were still running away? But I couldn't give up. <laughs> Couple more questions. Um, if you were to go back into the wild, would you change anything about what you did or? You know, everybody's asking me that, and the only way I can answer it is to say, of course I made mistakes, but I learned from the mistakes. And I don't think there's anything that, that I would want to change. So today we would never feed bananas. We just don't do that anymore. When I began, um, there, was, there was one other uh, field study in Japan, Japanese monkeys, and they had feeding stations. So it was, so for me, it was a little bit like one of the early anthropologists offering beads to the natives, you know, to try and get their friendship. And looking back on it, if Hugo and I hadn't set up a feeding station, he would not have got the kind of footage he got. I would never have got quite so close to the chimps to really understand them. And geographic wouldn't have 
uh, been able to do articles and they wouldn't have gone on funding. So it actually all worked out right. Now, if I could advise myself, knowing what I know now, and say to somebody, well, don't start a feeding station, it would be a mistake for me back then. So it just seems to have worked out right. <laughs> Firstly, thank you so much for coming to New Zealand. Um, we often portray ourselves as a clean and green nation and we pride ourselves on our natural beauty, but you've been traveling New Zealand for so long and coming here often. Do you think there's anything we can change to improve our country? Well, there's lots, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> you all know what you need to change in your country more than I do. How you change it is something you're going to have to work out for yourself. Um, you know about the cattle, I'm moving because the sun is right on me there. Yeah. It's horrible. Um, so, you know, there's the cattle problem, there's the pollution of the water problem, um, there's the way that invasive species are treated, the way they're talked about, pests, vermin, but we put them here. It's our fault, not theirs. They have feelings just like other animals. So feral cats, they're not any different from domestic cats, except there's nobody to nurture them and stroke them. Uh, so all of those are, you know, important things. And just so you hear this from me, because of all the stuff going around in the media, when we come to the use of 1080, as you know, it's a very, very cruel poison. It takes four days for the animals to die. So my point is, with an intellect that's taken us to Mars, enabled us to walk on the moon, developed all this amazing, you know, innovative technology like solar energy and stuff. Shouldn't it be possible for us to get together and find a better way of doing it? That's the exact message from me. And if you read something in the paper that's different, that's not true. This is what I believe. But I agonize for the suffering of the many animals that die, the way they die. I've seen videos of it, a cow dying, a horse dying, and a dog dying, and it's very, very sad. So who knows, maybe one among you will discover some way of doing it better. Because we can't leave them, because then you'll lose all your kiwis and creatures like that. So this is one of the things I say, nothing's black and white. It's a problem, and there are two sides to the to the argument, and both sides are right. So we have to try and find a solution. It's like, you know, if you make a, a legislation that you can only keep so many cows, you've got to get rid of the rest, or whatever it is that you say, then you've got to find a solution for the farmers. Somebody suggested growing hemp. Hemp is an amazing building material. It's amazing to make clothes out of. You know, it could be lots of money made out of just growing hemp. Thank you. Just remember, well, the world is not black and white. How about one more, one more question? Yep. One more question and two stories. Okay, excellent. That sounds like a good, uh, a good trade. So at the moment, it seems like there are so many things that I can't hear. So at the moment, it seems like there are so many new things and that we have to have the newest thing. And it seems like there's sort of built in obsolescence with some of our technology. And how do we change that? Because if we say, oh, we're not having that technology, then we seem like we, are, we have backwards thinking. So what yeah, are we meant to do? That's a very difficult one. I know we were talking about it the other day. You used to buy um, a piece of kitchen equipment, and if it went wrong, you could, you could mend it. Now, you can't open it, you can't open the electrical sockets, you can't, they've made it so that you have to buy a new one. And um, I don't know how you solve that, except by a huge wave of customers saying, we're not going to buy this unless you, but I don't know how you can do that. That's something for your generation to sort out. <laughs> All I know is it makes me mad. I get really, really upset. I mean, even the technology today that makes 
cars the way they are. You have to be a technician. You have to understand, you know, all sorts of complicated technology to drive a car. And what happens if it goes wrong? You can't do a thing. You have to take it back and pay people money to sort out all the electronics. It used to be that way. You could mend your own. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you two stories. Um, the first, a lot of people say, well, you know, you talk about animal intelligence, but what about a sense of humor? Surely animals don't have a sense of humor. Well, actually, I think quite a lot of animals do. But, um, and by the way, if you don't know about octopus intelligence, do look it up. The, the website's full of it, and you'll love it. It's so amazing what octopus do. And they're talking about their different personalities, and you know they recognize people, and they're very mischievous. But anyway, this story is about a gorilla, famous gorilla called Coco. And she was taught American Sign Language. She knew 700 signs. And she could have quite meaningful back and forth with her people. And on this particular occasion, she's just been taught all of her uh, colors, not just the primary colors, but orange and silver and, you know. So this young woman is occupying her while her supper is being got ready. And so she's testing her, you know, with the colors, uh, hold it up and Coco signs green and she signs purple or whatever this is. And um, she signs gold and she signs yellow and she signs, we've got blue on there, all of those. And then the young woman picks up a piece of white cloth. Well, here we are, white cloth. And Coco signs red, comes from lipstick, red. Um, so the young woman says, Coco, you know better than that, red. After a few times, the young woman says, Coco, if you don't tell me what color this is, you won't get apple juice for supper. So Coco takes the white cloth. She picks off a tiny piece of red fluff and she says, <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, that's a really funny one. And then there's a parrot. Now, we, we all know we shouldn't have pet parrots, but this woman got her parrot, uh, what is it now, about uh, 25 years ago, captive bred. Age three months, she'd always wanted to have a parrot, and she always felt, you know, when you have a baby, you don't hold something up in front of the baby and say green, grape, and then reward the baby when it says the word. You talk to your baby, you know, that's how you, you talk to them. So she <clears throat> determined that she would simply talk to Kisi, and it was a 24-hour job. She, she was a jeweler, she worked at home, and so she could be with Kisi all the time. And when he was young, she got him a lot of electronic toys because he loved pressing buttons and then chasing little cars across the floor and all that sort of thing. So now, move on in time. Oh, first time I met Kesey, um, I went in and he's he got a huge cage, but he's never in it. He's on it. So he's up right, right up there, little tiny African grey. And I look up feeling a bit stupid. And I say, hello, Kesey, I've heard so much about you. How nice to meet you. He looks down and says, that's Jane, got a chimp? <laughs> <laughs> now, move on, he was about eight then, and she'd been showing him pictures of me. So move on in time, he's now 15. And his, his um, partner, Amy, she's, she's very spiritual and very emotional. And she's tried to rescue an iguana from a pet shop, and it dies anyway. So she's laid it out on the ground, and she's got a box to bury it in. And <clears throat> she's burning sweet grass, and she's lit candles, and she's crying. So Kesey comes over, has a look at this situation, and says, try a new battery. <laughs> I mean, when you think about that, it's funny, but when you think about it. And so the last story, I had two animal ones, but here's the last one. And this is about a chimpanzee called Jojo. And he was taken from the wild, his mother was shot. He was alone in a zoo in the US for something like 
14, 15 years. And uh, of course, chimps should, a social, and they should be together, but he was alone. So he never learned how to behave like a chimp. And then the zoo gets a new director, and they get uh, funds for a large enclosure, and they surround it with a moat because chimps don't swim. And they bring in, I don't know how many other chimps, and then, you know, they gradually introduce Jojo, but he's still very uncertain. And so one day when one of the other males comes charging at him with bristling hair, Jojo's absolutely terrified, and he's so frightened, he gets over the barrier, which is to stop the chimps drowning in the deep water. And three times he disappears under the water, comes up for a gasp of breath, and then, then he's gone. And on the far shore is a keeper, and he... I think he went off to try and get a stick or something, but there's a man with his three little girls and his wife who visits the zoo one day a year, this particular day he visited, and he jumped in. The keeper tried to grab him, tell him he'd be killed. He had to swim under the water, feeling he got hold of Jojo's body, got this very heavy weight over his shoulder, felt movement, so Jojo's not dead manages to get over that barrier, pushes him back uh, into the enclosure. But the bank was built too steep. It was a mistake of the architect. So as Rick is about to get back over the barrier, he's standing there, and Jojo starts sliding back down the bank. Meanwhile, three of the big males are approaching, screaming, teeth showing what's happening down there. and. The people on the bank are screaming at Rick to curry, come back. It's all videoed. You can hear the wives yelling, the children crying. And you see Rick standing there. He's got one hand on the railing. And you see him look at his wife and family. And you see him look to where these three males are coming. And you see him look down at Jojo, who's just disappeared under the water. And he stands there motionless for a moment, then he went back. And again, he pushed Jojo up. And the three males just stop and look. And with Jojo making feeble efforts to grab something, he finally gets a thick tuft of grass. And with Rick pushing, manages to drag himself up to where the ground is level. And that evening, Rick was interviewed. And the interviewer said, what, what made you do that? You knew it was dangerous. Everybody was telling you. And Rick said, well, you see, I happened to look into his eyes, and it was like looking into the eyes of a man. And the message was, won't anybody help me? And that's the message I've seen in the eyes of so many animals, the little chimps tied up for sale in Africa, the chimps I got to see in the medical research labs, in the bad zoos, elephants chained, rocking from foot to foot. But I've seen it in the eyes of little street children as well. And if you see that look and you let your heart listen to it, we have to help, don't we? We have to help. So that's the last message. The planet is screaming out for our help. Mother Earth is calling for us. So Mother Earth calling to us, wanting us to help save. What do we say? Together we can. can. Together, Together we, we will. will. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>